It is high time we confront the rising tide of anti-Semitism on American campuses and beyond. Once, America was different. For 2,000 years since the Romans destroyed the Second Temple, caused the death of more than a million Jews, and eliminated Jewish sovereignty in the land of Israel, the overbearing shadow of anti-Semitism has hounded the Jewish people. From antiquity, through the Middle Ages, to the modern era, under Islamic rule and in Christian lands, in the East and in the West, Jews have been singled out for persecution. They have been caricatured and condemned, harassed and humiliated, maligned and marginalized, segregated and slandered. Too often, the persecution of the Jewish people has taken an even darker turn. For in the eyes of the anti-Semitic, the Jews are guilty of a sin that cannot be expiated. They are guilty of existing. And thus, condemnation paved the way to callous brutality Humiliation hardened the hearts of torturers and rapists, slander and blood libel, bred slaughter, century after century, where the exiled Jews settled, who grown, followed. America was different. A nation whose earliest founding documents recognizes with great moral clarity that it is self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This great nation, which promises equal protection to all under the law, was a beacon of hope to persecuted Jews, as it was to so many others. The city upon a hill was not without blemish. From America's earliest days, a current of anti-Semitic prejudice wormed its way onto these shores. Anti-Jewish slurs and negative stereotypes Suspicion and conspiracy theories, bigotry and discrimination were all present at times in the public sphere. By the first half of the 20th century, American Jews were routinely barred from many white collar and professional positions. At banks and law firms, hospitals, academic institutions and more, they were faced with housing restrictions, denied membership in social clubs, excluded from resort areas and subjected to severe admission quotas at many universities. By the 1940s, more than 100 anti-Semitic organizations regularly produced hate propaganda to the public with predictable consequences. Even then, however, the Constitution's religious liberty guarantee, among other factors, helped ensure that anti-Semitism here never reached the extent and severity of its most egregious manifestations abroad. America strove to be different. The unprecedented nature and scope of the Holocaust, the Nazi systematic genocide of six million Jews in Europe between 1941 and 1945, further changed the anti-Semitism equation in America. The Nazi defeat in the Second World War, combined with the widely witnessed horrors of the Holocaust, to bring a noticeable decline in anti-Semitism, a trend that continued through the 1970s. Anti-Semitism was relegated to the fringes of society, largely fading from view. Since then, American Jews, who already cherished what America stood for, have finally felt that they truly belonged, that they were accepted here as they have never been accepted by any of the world's nations. They wholeheartedly believed that America is different. Most kept believing until recently, despite mounting evidence of increasing anti-Semitic rhetoric and behavior. Jewish cemeteries and institutions defaced with swastikas and slurs, verbal and physical assaults in public spaces and on public transportation. Two dozen American Jews murdered and, a dozen more, and dozens more injured in attacks on community centers, synagogues, kosher supermarkets in the last decade alone. They kept believing because they so badly wanted to believe. That belief was violently shattered on October 8, and its, stand, and its charts have been shattered again and again and again in the 53 days since, shattered into ever smaller fragments that the mind can barely perceive anymore. It was not shattered by the most devastating massacre of Jews since the Holocaust on October 7. Nor was it shattered by the carefully premeditated murder or violent kidnapping of a thousand Israeli civilians whose sole sin was that same old Jewish sin of existing, 
a sin that, as the Hamas terrorists took care to remind us, cannot be expiated by a lifetime of advocacy for peaceful coexistence or by leaving on the correct side of the 1949 armistice agreement line, well within the, that portion of the historic Jewish homeland that the nations of the world recognized as the state of Israel. That belief was not even shattered by the endless stream of atrocities, many filmed and widely distributed by the terrorists themselves, right out of the pogrom playbook. Brutal gang rapes and the gleeful torture of the helpless, babies riddled with bullets or decapitated, a father and child tied together by metal cord, then burned alive, and the list goes on and on. These terrors perpetrated by Hamas, an organization proudly anti-Semitic in creed and in action, which espouses the old hateful tropes and blood libels, and its founding charter recognizes neither Jewish rights to the same self-determination as all other nations, nor even a Jewish right to exist, were not what shattered the belief that America is different. Instead, that belief is shattered daily on American campuses and city streets. It is shattered by the words and action of some students, faculty, and administrators at our great institutions of higher learning. It is shattered by the excited crowds joyfully celebrating and glorifying barbaric atrocities and identifying with our perpetrators down to their jihadi headbands without exception or limitation by the vicious symbolism of tearing down posters of brutally kidnapped civilians to eliminate the risk of humanizing their plight by the contextualizing and excusing of gang rapes and elaborate child murders in defiance of reason or morality. The belief that America is different is shattered, my friends, by the inescapable realization that no such behavior would have taken place on our campuses or beyond had the atrocities of October 7 been targeted at the civilians of any other nation on earth. By the full-throated chance, not 80 years since Auschwitz, for the elimination of the only Jewish state in the world, by the two-faced behavior of those who claim near anti-Zionism, only to turn around and bully, threaten, or attack people who bear no Zionist connection whatsoever, except that familiar offense of being identifiably Jewish. Can America remain different when anti-Semitism moves from the dark fringes of society into the heart of our institution? And what does that mean, not just for American Jewry, but for this great nation and its once self-evident truth? Before turning to our distinguished guests who will help us consider this fraught moment in which we find ourselves, I would like to invite Dean Cole to offer, to offer his opening remarks. Thank you, Dr. Tor. My name is Marcus Cole. I'm the Dean of Notre Dame Law School, and I want to welcome you to this important uh, discussion on the rise of anti-Semitism on America's campuses and elsewhere. I am both proud and saddened, deeply ashamed, in fact, that we have to have this discussion. I'm proud that this conversation is being sponsored by the Notre Dame Religious Liberty Initiative which is one of the most important programs that we have here at Notre Dame, the purpose of which is to uphold and uplift the, the freedom of conscience of all people, whether they are people of faith or not, uh, all around the world and here in the United States. And so I'm glad, I'm proud that we're having this discussion at Notre Dame. It's a discussion that's not taking place at enough institutions around the world. And I think that that's what makes Notre Dame uh, different. But I'm saddened and ashamed that in 2023, that we have to have a discussion about the rise of anti-Semitism in our society and in our culture. We've made very little progress if this is the case. Now, I wanna say something about what this is and what this is not. This is a discussion about the rise of anti-Semitism. It is not, a debate about who is right and who is wrong uh, with regard to the war in the Holy Land right now. This is not a debate about the policies of the government of Israel. And in fact, it is a heinous form of antisemitism to equate hatred for someone who is a Jew 
by virtue of the fact that they are a Jew with the policies of the Israeli government. That in itself is a form of anti-Semitism. It is also not a two-sided debate. There are not two sides to anti-Semitism in the same way there are not two sides to racism. When George Floyd was murdered, there was no debate about whether black people should be murdered. Likewise, we should not be having a debate about whether Jews should be murdered for being Jews. Third, I want to say that, uh, that uh, a discussion about antisemitism does not imply that there is not racism or hatred toward other groups. We can have a discussion about racism against black people without having to go through every other target of hate. Likewise, it is a form of antisemitism itself to insist that when we talk about antisemitism, we also have to talk about uh, uh, discrimination against Muslims. We have to talk about discrimination against Arabs. We have to talk about discrimination against uh, uh, Pakistanis, or we have to talk about discrimination against Blacks or Hispanics. We are having a discussion about hatred against Jews. That does not imply that any other form of hatred is acceptable or okay, or that is beyond our concern. So with that being said, I want to introduce the leader of our Religious Liberty Initiative, uh, the faculty director of uh, the Notre Dame Religious Li Liberty Initiative, Professor Stephanie Barkley, who will uh, guide us in our uh, further discussions of this topic. Thank you. Sorry, I thought I'd get off to an exciting start with some missing notes, but thank you all for being here. Thank you to Marcus for his leadership and vision with the Religious Liberty Initiative. And thank you uh, to our colleague, Avi Tour, without whose help and, and vision this event wouldn't be possible. And I'd like to just give him a, a round of applause to thank him for how We're incredibly lucky to have a lineup of powerhouse distinguished speakers who can bring some expertise and perspective to this important issue. I'm going to start by uh, introducing our keynote, Professor, Professor Ruth Weiss, but after that, I will then come up and introduce our other excellent panelists as we'll have a discussion following that keynote. So Professor Weiss was a professor of Yiddish literature and comparative literature at Harvard University, and before that at McGill University in Montreal. She's currently a senior fellow at the Tikva Center in New York, and she has published several books on literature, culture, and politics, including the modern Jewish canon, A Journey Through Literature and Culture. No joke, Making Jewish Humor. I hope we hear some of that today. And Jews in Power, and most recently, Free as a Jew, a personal memoir of national self-liberation. With that, Ruth, we'll turn it over to you. Well, it is um, a great pleasure to be here, may I say, first time that I'm at Notre Dame, and I thank you for the opportunity of discussing this troubling subject. Um, thank you. I hope you can hear, especially here at Notre Dame. And why do I say especially here at Notre Dame? Because in 1924, um, almost exactly 100 years ago, a bunch of students from this university defeated a contingent of the Ku Klux Klan that had tried to get a foothold here in South Bend. Um, you see, I looked up the university and this amazing thing I found. Um, well, I don't recommend the tactics that they use, but I much applaud the outcome 
because as a result of what they did, the Klan never came back for the second um, uh, event that they had planned to sponsor here, and they never took over South Bend. Uh, they canceled all their future events here. And now we're here to talk about um, something, um, I would say arguably worse if possible, um, that challenges this country today, as was implied by the uh, speakers before me. So let me start with an anecdote um, from about the same period on our subject. The mayor of a town in Europe says to his deputy, round up all the Jews and all the bicyclists. And uh, the deputy says, why the bicyclists? So that's the joke. And uh, if you weren't laughing out loud, it's because it's built on certain expectations that you're lucky not to share, actually. The deputy, who can't understand why he should round up bicyclists, doesn't question the premise for rounding up the Jews. The joke amuses those who know that singling out the Jews for blame is ridiculous and no less preposterous than arresting bicyclists. But they also know that Jews are routinely targeted for no sound reason, and they find it funny to see this absurdity exposed. Why the bicyclists reveals that the reflexive anti-Semite never questions the illogic of singling out the Jews, and that reflex can become so common that we're not even aware of it. So um, what I'd like to do is to say something about anti-Semitism itself, which is what I have thought about most of my life. Um, anti-Semitism is the politics of the pointing finger. The pointing finger makes Jews the defendant, and it directs suspicion at them. So actually, the movement itself began in Germany in the 1870s when Wilhelm Marr, a fascinating person, created the League of Anti-Semitism. That's what he called it, the League of Anti-Semitism, to show that what others welcomed as emancipation was really a Jewish plot to conquer Germany from within. The mid to late 19th century was, as you know, a time of tremendous change with many resulting social problems, as times of change always are. And anti-Semitism provided a simple answer. You know why you're unemployed? It's because the Jews have your jobs. And you know why you're poor? It's because rich Jews have their money. Uh, revolutionaries are challenging traditional authority. Well, it's the Jews. The church is losing its power. Uh, our country is being taken away from us by strangers and so on and so forth. A snowballing movement of grievance and blame pointed the finger at a very small people with a hugely inflated image. The targeted explanation worked so well that politicians began to be elected in Europe on a platform of anti-Semitism, and within 50 years, Adolf Hitler had turned it into a massive winning strategy. He became the chancellor of Germany in 1933, and he set out to establish the Third Reich across Europe, where, not coincidentally, many other countries harbored movements that likewise held their Jews responsible for the difficulties that the Jews had neither caused nor could in any way alleviate. So looking at the functions of anti-Semitism then, why it works, um, it helps us to understand why it is now back in America. And I would just say that understanding is uh, the way one goes about solving problems. But what I would remind myself all the time and everyone else is that just because you can understand a problem still does not mean that you can necessarily solve it. Um, okay, so uh, the functions. First, as I say, a simple explanation for what is going wrong. Since Jews are a self-defined minority, people who have to prove themselves useful to those among whom they live, they tend to do relatively well when given the chance. And the more they accomplish, the more they accumulate, the more likely they are to be blamed for disadvantaging the rest of the population. Secondly, one of its greatest functions, anti-Semitism builds coalitions 
among otherwise competing factions. So conservatives blame Jews for being radicals, and radicals blame Jews for being reactionaries, conservatives. Uh, we've seen how it worked in Europe. But in 1945, the same year that Nazism went down to defeat in Europe, the Arab League used the same, very same political tool to create a pan-Arab coalition in the Middle East. Leaders of seven countries, later joined by another 15, rejected the principle of coexistence, which, by the way, was the premise of the United Nations, they rejected it. And they organized, how? Against the Jewish state. The only thing that they had in common and in common with Muslim countries. Now, of course, some Arab leaders, even at the time, did want to coexist with Israel, and some have done so since. Um, and yet, for now, pan Arab, pan Islamic war against the Jewish state, by the way, countries with 640 times more land than the state of Israel, um, organized against a country the size of Burley, New Jersey. And this remains the most lopsided war in human history, and by now one of the longest. Now, you may all be familiar with the modern concept of intersectionality that claims that all oppression is linked, gender, racial identity, sexuality, disability, and nationality. Now, this deceptive, a very persuasive idea has created a powerful coalition of grievance against so-called white supremacy, patriarchy, homophobia, racism, and partisan power, and much else. So when Palestinian Arabs presented themselves as the victims of Jewish colonial, patriarchal, white supremacist, and whatever else oppression, they became the face of this otherwise faceless, ambiguous movement. Anti-Semitism is the original coalition of grievance and blame. So it's not surprising to see it conscripted as the poster child of campus intersectionality. Being against the Jews and Israel has come to unite even neo-Nazis with the woke coalition. How strange is that? Third, the pointing finger deflects attention from the actions of the accusers. It is what I would call, if you know how magicians work, um, prestidigitation. Uh, the pointing finger points there, as the magician points there, so that you never see what these people are actually doing, why they want this power, why they are pointing the finger. And so um, it organizes protest, aggression, and violence against others, away from those doing the pointing. In 1975, a coalition of Soviet and Arab blocs engineered the passage of the, in the United Nations General Assembly of the resolution actually equating Zionism with racism. Daniel Patrick Moynihan, then the US ambassador to the United Nations, called this a day of infamy, the iconic description of Pearl Harbor. To smear Israel as racist was a bigger lie, that is to say, a bigger inversion than anti Semitism's original claim that the Jews were out to conquer Germany from within. Middle Eastern leaders who refused Jews their right to a homeland, and by the way, expelled Jews from their own countries, accused Jews of depriving Arabs of theirs. So Arab leaders went even further. In refusing to accept the partition of Palestine, they kept the Palestinians perpetually displaced, in quotation marks, as proof of Jewish occupation, in quotation marks. And they blamed the Jews for the refugees that they themselves had created. The pointing finger deflects attention from the failure of those leaders to develop their countries, to resettle the uh, Arabs, there was an exchange of populations fleeing, you understand. Exactly as many Jews were forced to flee Arab lands as the Arabs who then fled the state of Israel. 
but the Jews absorbed all the refugees, took their pride in making sure that no one was a refugee for more than a lifetime, certainly, and not even that long. But the Arabs did exactly the opposite, made sure that the Palestinians never got resettled so that they could always use them as this moral uh, force to hold Jews responsible. So um, that's about how important the pointing finger is for us. The idea that Jews are a corrupting people, as you heard, has a long history um, in other cultures, in Christianity and in Islam, but each iteration tries to distinguish itself from the one before. So German anti-Semitism insisted that it was different from the religious anti-Judaism that had preceded it, just as anti-Zionism distinguished itself from anti-Semitism. Yet each obviously draws from and builds on um, what had come before. Now, if you wonder, as many people do, what is the relationship of anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism? I would say it's really pretty straightforward. Anti-Semitism had targeted the Jews in dispersion for the 2,000 years that they lived in other people's lands. And anti-Zionism more easily attacks them in their homeland. As the Jews changed, so did the charge against them, one for being dispersed and the others for having the homeland. Now fifth, and I could go on, but with this I will end this uh, listing, uh, of all the modern ideologies, fascism, socialism, communism, Islamism, one might add democracy if you want to to that, anti-Semitism is by definition the only one that is entirely negative against. Think of all the energy in negative campaigning or in rooting against the opposite team in sports, um, something this college knows for sure. And you'll appreciate how the war against Israel and the Jews has done so well even here in America. Cleanse Germany or free Palestine of the Jews is much handier than actually trying to reform the economy and successfully run a country. So how did all this negative ideology reemerge in America and take over some of the major educational institutions? Well, this would be the, the place for an entire seminar on pan-Arab, pan-Islamist war against Israel, the shift of their tactics from we will drive Israel into the sea to the Jews are colonizing the Middle East, on the use of the United Nations as a forum for defaming Israel, um, and um, on the funding and special spread of anti-Israel Middle East studies and the conscription of other susceptible minorities to the anti-Israel coalition and so forth. Back in 1992, over 30 years ago, my colleague at Harvard, then a professor of Afro-American studies, whom you may know from PBS, Henry Louis Gates, already worried about the rise of anti-Semitism among black students on campus, gave an excellent description of how some African-American leaders were using Jew brain to gain adherence for what he called a barricaded withdrawal into racial authenticity. And I quote, it's a marvelous op-ed piece, by the way, that you can look up. The strategy of these apostles of hate, I believe, is best understood as ethnic isolationism. They, will, they know that the more isolated Black America becomes, the greater their power. And uh, what's the most effective way to begin to sever Black America from its allies? Bash the Jews. These demagogues apparently calculate, and you're halfway there. So this is uh, back in 1992. I would say the best analysis of the black aspect of um, anti-Semitism that I have read anywhere. So ethnic politics that he describes destroy the civil rights ideal of individual rights, irrespective of race, creed, gender, sexual preference, and ethnicity. And paradoxically, you see, organizing against a very small and presumably parochial target can mobilize the largest, most diverse and inclusive coalition of belligerents. Now, why should this be of matter to you here? 
Well, when I was once collecting material on this subject, I came across a book called How Democracies Perish by the French intellectual Jean-Francois Level, warning against what he feared. And what he feared at that time was communism. And he felt that democracy would not be able to withstand its uh, attack. And then I read the following, quoting him, democracy probably could have endured had it been the only type of political organization in the world. But it was not basically structured to defend itself against outside enemies seeking its annihilation. And then he writes, democracy is by its very nature turned inward. Its vocation is the patient and realistic improvement of life in the community and so forth. The farther I read, the more I realized that one could substitute the Jewish people and the state of Israel for everything that he wrote about democracy, and that explained much of what I was trying to describe. The Hamas attack of October 7th, 2023, is the follow-up, of course, to the Al-Qaeda attack of 9-11-2001. Israel is called the Little Satan, and the United States is the Big Satan. Israeli and American flags are burned together in Iran. The two attacks are interlocked, and winning one, I would say, is the best way of winning the other. In the Middle East, the enemies of coexistence just as often go after Christians as they do after Jews. But in Western democracies, it's the Jews that they go after mostly. So let me wind down here by turning the pointing finger back to where it belongs, to the false accuser. Everyone refers to the Hamas attack on Israel as, quote, the deadliest day for Jews since the Holocaust. Now think about that for a moment. The Nazi murder of six million Jews in five years, which is until now figured as the epitome of evil, has been eclipsed in a single day. Now, I realize that some of you may be genuinely offended by microaggressions, by the use of offensive epithets, so you certainly won't want to see the bodies of babies burned in ovens, of women raped and dismembered, of people decapitated, of every kind of sadistic torture, no human being should have to be exposed to seeing that carnage, let alone to suffering its consequences. When Nazi atrocities were exposed, people said that they did not know what had been happening. The excuse of ignorance, which was often legitimate, accounted for their acquiescence or inaction. But the Hamas invaders filmed themselves they advertised themselves committing these deeds as a vehicle of recruitment. And they seem to have done very well, judging by their popularity on American campuses. A professor at Cornell said that he was exhilarated by the carnage. And mass demonstrations against Israel on behalf of Hamas have turned into riots against Jews on several campuses. Happily, nothing like that here. So I think that we owe it to the demonstrators to see what they're applauding. Let's not wait to build new wings to the Holocaust Museum. Let's have the courage to see Jew killing in action. In particular, I think that we Americans have to see what our fellow Americans are applauding. We don't owe it to the victims. We owe it to those who are acting in the name of Islam. So there is no minimizing the damage of anti-Jewish politics once it really gets going. We've seen how it flourishes, but it is also certain, and I would say, look at the evidence, it is certain to destroy any society that it overtakes. All these functions you see that I've listed of deflecting responsibility, of pointing the finger at others rather than tackling real problems, of fomenting aggression that soon becomes an end in itself. All these, these things deform and dehumanize the aggressors. It can make the Jews bleed. And let me assure you that the Jews are bleeding at this moment. I don't think that... Uh, Hopefully none of you can even imagine in how many ways and how badly. But Jews recover. 
and their assailants, their assailants, sorry, turn bestial. The pointing finger tries to get us to focus on Israel, as you've seen. Is Israel obeying international law? Is Israel oppressing the Arabs? Look at its rotten leadership. And almost everybody obeys the pointing finger so obligingly, um, even if to, it's to defend and not to join in the attack, but it hardly matters. Anti-Semitism is never about the Jews. It is the winning strategy of anti-Semites, and it turns them eventually into monsters of evil. And as I say, it corrupts the societies that they infect with their politics of blame. So things are pretty grim at the moment. Um, and because the Jews are the special targets of this current crisis, many of us do feel pretty grim. But I have to say that I feel but I can say that we have hopeful signs indeed. The Abraham Accords were a sign that some leaders in the Middle East were really beginning to accept the principle of coexistence. And one has only to look at MBS, as he likes to be called, the Crown Prince and Prime Minister of Saudi Arabia. Um, the advantages of autocracies lies in their ability that the, all we have to do is to have a, a ruler who determines the direction of the country. And when the ruler acts wisely, improvements can quickly follow. Unfortunately, Iran is still moving in the opposite direction. And we have yet to see which of the two Muslim camps will prevail. I think that we have a great stake in the outcome. So meanwhile, if the future of this country is at stake. And in a democracy, mobs can rule. Would any of us have believed that anti-Semitism, the politics of the pointing finger, could support such depravity and gain such prominence in the universities, which are charged with preserving this precious republic? Um, but as I say, speaking here gives me hope. If students of Notre Dame once helped to defeat the Ku Klux Klan, they should certainly be able to stop the rot undermining this wonderful country at the moment. It can be done, and I'm hopeful that it will be done. Thank you. I'm going to invite our panelists to come take their seats now. While, uh, while our panelists are taking their seats, I think we need to turn up these mics a little bit. Just a reminder to those in the audience that if you use the QR code, you can send in questions live. I can see them on my laptop. We've had some great questions come in so far, but wanted to, again, remind you and make you aware of that feature. Um, so first of all, thank you to Ruth for that exceptional keynote. That was really illuminating. Um, I want to introduce our other fantastic panelists. We have to my far left, the Honorable Kenneth Marcus, who's the chairman of the Lewis Brandeis, Brandeis Center for Human Rights Under Law, a public interest advocacy organization that he founded to advance the civil and human rights of the Jewish people and promote justice for all. He's also professorial lecturer in law at George Washington University and a distinguished senior fellow at George Mason University's Antonin Scalia School of Law. He's the author of Definition of Antisemitism in Oxford University Press and Jewish Identity and Civil Rights in America in the Cambridge University Press. During his public service career, Marcus served as the Assistant U.S. Secretary of Education for Civil Rights, among other senior positions in civil rights enforcement. Professor Jeff Jeffrey Vleininger is the Joseph Brodsky Collegiate Professor of History and Judaic Studies at the University of Michigan. He's the author of four award-winning books in the history of Jewish life in Russia and Ukraine, including most recently in the midst of civilized Europe, the, U the Ukrainian programs of 1980 and 1921 and the onset of the Holocaust, which was a finalist for the National Jewish Book Award, the Lionel Gerber Award and the Wingate Literary Prize and won two Canadian Jewish Book Awards. Weidlinger is chair of the Academic Advisory Council of the Center for Jewish History, a member of the Academic Committee of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, a member of the Executive Committee of the American Academy for Jewish Research, 
a former vice president of the Association for Jewish Studies, and a former director of the Frankel Center for Judaic Studies at the University of Michigan and the Bourne's Jewish Study Program at Indiana University. Of course, we now know who Professor Weiss is, and we're very also lucky to have with us the most reverend Robert McClory, who was appointed by Pope Francis in 2019 to be the fifth bishop of the Diocese of Gary. He was ordained a bishop of the Roman Catholic Church and installed as the diocesan bishop on February 11th, um, 2020, at the Cathedral of the Holy Angels in Gary, Indiana. Prior to responding to God's call to the priesthood, Bishop McClory earned a bachelor's degree in political science and communications from Oakland University in Rochester, Michigan, a master's in public policy and administration from Columbia University, and a law degree from the University of Michigan, after which he practiced for three years. He studied philosophy at the Sacred Heart major seminary in Detroit theology at the Pontifical North American College in Rome and completed his bachelor's in sacred theology at the Pontifical Gregorian University. Um, and he has a license in canon law at the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas Angelicum in Rome. So please join me in welcoming and giving, giving a hand of applause to our panel. Can you all hear okay or do these still need to go up? They're good. Okay, great. So, Ken, I'm going to start with just a question for you. Give us a little bit context about the lay in the land. Um, for those who might wonder whether anti-Semitism is really on the rise in the U.S. right now, what are some of the facts on the ground that will tell us about this question, Jewish hate crimes? How did we get to this uh, situation? How in 2023 are we dealing with this level of anti-Semitism on U.S. campuses and universities? So we're starting with an easy one, huh? So, <laughs> thank you, Stephanie, and kudos to the Religious Liberty uh, Institute. Uh, I'm also grateful for having been able to hear live the delivery of Dean Cole's remarks, which I fully expect will be shared virtually through the internet for some time. So um, um, hearing that uh, wisdom was 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 a, was a privilege. Um, there, there's some data on it, uh, both worldwide and in the United States, about the extraordinary increase in incidents of anti-Semitism post-October 7, um, which should be shocking. It should be shocking that the response to atrocities uh, would be not a realization of the problem that we have and a desire to confront anti-Semitism, but rather an explosion uh, of additional incidents. Um, I can sp speak as a practitioner, though, about uh, what we have seen at the Louis D. Brandeis Center. Uh, and I'll put it this way. If you had asked me the question on October 6th, uh, where are we? Uh, I would have had to tell you that we are seeing record levels of anti-Semitism in this country and especially on college campuses. Uh, that we had, uh, after half a century of improvement, seen a couple decades of things getting worse, but the last few years were particularly bad. And from the perspective of October 6th, uh, I would have said there's lots of data and our own anecdotal information to say it's never been so bad. Uh, the Louis D. Brandeis Center had just grown to about 10 litigators, um, the biggest we'd ever been, and yet we were also the most exhausted we'd ever been, uh, the most thinly stretched with far more cases than we'd had uh, before. That was October 6th. We're finally getting to the point of being able to deal with the world of October 6th. The next day, of course, everything changed. Uh, in the three weeks following October 7th, uh, we uh, have received approximately, well, more than, more than a tenfold increase uh, in uh, intake uh, compared to the, um, uh, the period before that. In three weeks, we got a year's worth, um, and that would be not any given year, um, but the worst year. So three weeks of that. And that was before uh, we announced with the Anti-Defamation League and Hillel International and Gibson Dunn a partnership involving a highly publicized uh, hotline, uh, which then led to a further uh, escalation. Now, people can ask, well, to some extent, is there just more public awareness? And sure, there's more public awareness. But that does not explain the far more than tenfold increase of, 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 what, you're, of what we're seeing. Now, the... The character of the problem that we've been seeing on college campuses has evolved over the some 20 years that we've been looking at it, and, it, and the evolution has heightened uh, in recent uh, months and in recent weeks. There was a period of time where we tracked and responded to campuses in which uh, anti-Semitic and anti-Zionist 
language uh, in lectures and public events and rallies created toxic environments for Jewish students. It was bad. Um, it was systemic, uh, but it had to do with the general climate for students and faculty across the institution. In the last few years, as the rate of incidents has increased, we've also seen a change in their nature with a greater amount of targeting, often in connection with an effort to deny normalcy to the Jewish community and especially to those who support uh, Israel and consider it to be an integral part of their identity. So we would see initially, a few years ago, situations in which uh, student organizations, especially those who consider themselves to be part of a progressive space, would try to exclude uh, the Jewish organizations from partnering with them, participating with them, even in things like Know Your Rights fairs. That evolved from a targeting of Jewish organizations and collectivities to a targeting of Jewish individuals. So within the last couple of semesters, we've seen significant increase of cases in which individual Jewish students are targeted for some form of marginalization or exclusion. That's often a situation in which a a Jewish student will face an impeachment effort uh, from a student government position uh, based on their perceived or actual support for Israel, um, or even uh, non-Jewish in some case for their association with, with Jewish students, uh, cases in which um, uh, uh, Jews who have uh, any sort of uh, Zionist or even non-Zionist uh, connections will sometimes be excluded from things like a, a book club in the case of the University of Vermont, or even, forgive me for saying this, um, a sexual assault survivors um, uh, group, uh, advocacy group at the State University of New York and New Paltz. So we've seen this both increase and um, evolution uh, from a more systemic to also a more targeting problem. Since October 7, we've seen this explosion of incidents, which include all of the different forms we've seen before, together with, in some cases, a celebration of mass assaults and even mass murder of, of, of Jewish people. Thank you. That's very alarming and helpful to have that broader context. Professor Weidlinger, can you speak a little bit to some of your expertise in the historical context and, and speak to us about how the historical context and background of persecution connects to and relates to what we're seeing today? Yeah, so first, uh, thank you, Stephanie, for the question and for uh, having me here. And thank you, Avi, and thank you, Dean Cole, as well, for those powerful remarks. And thanks to the Religious Liberty Initiative. Um, it is a pleasure to be here, although not particularly under the circumstances. Um, well, I think, you know, I'm a scholar of anti-Semitism and of the Holocaust, particularly the Holocaust in Ukraine. Um, I will acknowledge speaking here as well that it pains me deeply that the two countries in which I spend most of my time abroad, Ukraine and Israel, um, are today both at war and both suffering um, under very difficult circumstances. Uh, I think the way we talk about anti-Semitism today, we can learn a lot from the way that American historians lately have been talking about race, which is to recognize the ways in which anti-Semitism is deeply systemic and embedded within Western European culture. And the reason for this is because Christianity, which sits at the core of Western culture, emerged as a, as a supersessionist movement within Judaism. Uh, the Gospels and early church fathers came to see their faith as having replaced the older religion that was still practiced by Jews in their midst. And they came to see Jews as the ultimate foil. And this persisted uh, through Europe for centuries. Um, as Augustine put it, citing God's promise to Rebecca, uh, and the elder shall serve the younger. Judaism should always be in a subservient position to Christianity. And the most famous example of this narrative, which was very powerful um, in its time, was Matthew's account of the persecution, arrest, and trial of Jesus, and particularly the line, his blood be upon us and on our children, which meant that not only were the Jews there at the time of the crucifixion of the Pharisees responsible for the uh, crucifixion of Christ, but so were all Jews for all time. And this was taken very seriously in the medieval and early modern period. And often was implemented 
in um, in was implemented in shows of violence in after passion plays that depicted the crucifixion in which the line was uttered and the people in the midst villagers and townspeople would look around and say well here the Jews in our midst are responsible for this deed and would go and commit um, and commit violence against them this was also reinforced by countless pieces of art frescoes woodcuts um, uh, icons throughout Europe that show the crucifixion scene of course and with Jews with their very distinctive hats uh, standing by the side and often even mocking uh, Jesus up on, the, up on the cross. Later myths emerged in Europe that Jews need to reenact the crucifixion by killing Christian children and using their blood for ritualistic murder, um, that or for ritualistic purposes. And that uh, evolved into the myth that Jews use Christian blood in the baking of the Passover matzahs, um, something that came about because of the concurrence in time between Passover and Easter. So this persistence of Jews in their midst was always a problem for Christian Europe that looked upon the Jews as uh, a subjugated people, wondered why they were dispersed, and argued that that dispersion was punishment for Jewish crimes, and the Jews were dispersed for the purpose of being witnesses. Um, the myth of the wandering Jew, the people without a homeland, became a very prominent trope. And Christ, who was seen as the embodiment of love, was contrasted with Jews who were seen as the embodiment of justice, who were seen as being incapable of mercy and only capable of strict justice. We see this most famously in Shakespeare's uh, Merchant of Venice, with Portia, of course, claiming that the quality of mercy is so important, and Shylock insisting on justice and the law. So throughout the Christian world, Jews were laws against Jews were enacted, um, concretizing the concept of Jewish subservience to Christianity. And a whole series of restrictions, of legal restrictions, were imposed upon Jewish communities in Europe, making Jews the perennial other and embedding this notion of Jewish otherness within Europe. But during the Enlightenment, when many legal restrictions on the Jewish population were lifted, Jews began to enter positions of leadership for the first time. But pre-existing attitudes towards Jews that were so embedded in the culture remained. So even as secularists rejected the church's teachings, they still held many long-surviving uh, you know, long stereotypes against the Jews. And this was a truth that Alfred Dreyfus, the French Jewish officer who was accused and tried for treason in 1894, learned that no matter how assimilated or how accomplished Jew they were, Jews would always be regarded as suspicious and their loyalty would be questioned. And it was this revelation that brings us to the next stage that I want to talk about a little bit, which is conspiracy. This belief that Jews have outsized power. Um, and we see it uh, in this belief that powerful old elites came to understand that they could instrumentalize popular conceptions of the Jews to their advantage. So when ideas like liberalism, democracy, freedom of speech began to threaten old established elites in late 19th century Europe, those elites realized they could discredit these ideas by claiming that they were just Jewish plots, by blaming them on the Jews. And this is the essence of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which many of you may have heard of. But the Protocols of the Elders of Zion is all about these ideas like freedom of the press and liberalism. But it twists it and say, you know, you think that these are good ideas, you think that they're going to help you, but really they're just tools of the Jews. Europe's legislative bodies are just another tool that the Jews use to deceive the masses. The free press, Hitler later said, um, was a lying press, was a tool of Jewish deception. It became a very effective means of tapping into these pre-existing negative associations that Europeans had against Jews and tying it to any idea that they wanted to discredit. Every modern idea could be presented as a nefarious Jewish invention. The free market and capitalism was the invention of Jews to oppress uh, the unsuspecting masses. And so was communism. When the Bolsheviks took power in Russia and promised land, bread, and peace to the people, how do the old elites convince the people not to accept land, bread, and peace? They say, well, it's just a tool of the Jews. And by the way, in America, Henry Ford said the same thing in the international Jew, that he took even ideas like ready-to-wear clothing, he said, was a tool of the Jews to democratize the masses so that anybody can wear, can dress nicely, and you don't know who's an elite and who's a common person. Um, all it took was one Jew in a position of power 
um, to provide evidence that the Jews were conspiring together to rule the entire world. And today, this notion of power is often framed in terms of privilege. Certainly today in America, Jews have been successful in many spheres, in part because of the racial dynamics of the new world that for the first time allowed Jews to present themselves as white, as part of the dominant group. But the presentation of Jews as white made many social justice activists complacent about Jewish security. Uh, as events like the mass shooting at a Pittsburgh synagogue show, the European legacy of Jew hatred, though, persists in the new world. Um, on my campus, even before October 7th, this summer, we saw a whole spate of uh, vandalism of Jewish buildings on campus with swastikas and with homophobic graffiti. But this notion of Jewish privilege is precarious. It can be taken away at any moment, a fact that many historically conscious Jews remember well. Because historically, when Jews have been targeted for murder, their elite status has not saved them. And quite the contrary, it's often been on account of the allegation that they're privileged, that they have too much power, that Jews have been targeted. And I think we can draw an analogy here with Israel. Just as Jews in America are derided as being part of the privileged elite, the Jewish state is similarly regarded as all-powerful. Um, Israel, we are told, is an apartheid, genocidal, settler, colonialist, terrorist, racial, racist, imperialist entity. Um, every evil in the world is thrown at it. Um, as I heard a few weeks ago on my college campus, um, in a rally that took place on my campus, the reason that students are facing rising tuition right now is because their tuition money is being used to support the Jewish state. The reason that there is homeless in America is because our tax money is being sent to Israel to support the Jewish state. The alleged evils of the Jewish state provide simple answers to all of our woes. And then I'll just end on one point that Ruth also made, which is that anti-Semitism provides as a very effective means of building coalitions. And I'll note that um, this was, for instance, the Unite the Right rally um, in Charlottesville did exactly that. It united the right around the notion of anti-Semitism. And sim similarly, on my college campus today, a vote against Israel was supposed to take place that was just actually canceled about an hour ago. Um, but the vote was being led by a group that called itself, quote, the largest multicultural coalition in the university's history, um, because it is this anti-Semitism that allows these disparate groups to unite together very effectively. Uh, so I'll end on that. Thank you. Uh Bishop Kitlori, could you speak to why the rise of anti-Semitism that we're seeing isn't just a Jewish issue, it's about why it's an issue that all faith communities should be concerned about? Thank you for that. Thank you for that question. Um, I'm honored to be here today. And I think uh, as I reflect on the events of October 7th, uh, it would have been just a few weeks before, you know, watching what was supposedly kind of a sci-fi fantasy type movie and seeing marauders come in and just wantonly attack a civilian population. And I remember wanting to look away from that, this work of fiction, because it was so disturbing and jarring. That was fiction, that was in some other fantasy world. And as the images unfolded on October 7th, one couldn't look away, one couldn't just pause or fast forward one had to acknowledge that what Hamas did to the Jews is evil. It is evil. And it is beyond disappointing that we can't just stop and say that. Uh, Dean Cole certainly presented their other conversations for other times. And when somebody says, well, that was evil, but that's wrong. I mean, it was just evil evil, and we need to declare it as such. And even if we can't personally erase and undo and correct that evil, to declare something as evil, we believe is, we call it a spiritual work of mercy. It's admonishing the sinner. It's saying that's wrong. I come to this with a, a variety of perspectives, uh, and I'm so grateful for the history that was presented in this regard. Certainly, um, there are so many instances that continue to reverberate today. As myself, an alum of the University of Michigan, and, and, and delighted to have Professor here, it saddened me to read that the granddaughter of a Holocaust survivor, who herself wore in 
her own Jewish script, her family name, simply because it had some Jewish lettering on it, was made fun of, was indeed spit at, was shouted at, and the crowd was there. What struck me is that she said, it was obviously very hard to stay focused. All I had in the back of my mind was that this woman yelling at me and seeing other people just stand by and watch it happen and not say anything. Mm -hmm. To watch it happen and not say anything. I'd like to take a moment um, to give a little bit of recap as to how the church, the Catholic Church, has uh, come to grapple with this in an area that really was a remarkable development uh, going back about 50 years ago. Uh, the Second Vatican Council was really a, a watershed moment in the life of the church, and so it issued many, many documents, uh, but a number of them were unprecedented, including the Declaration on the Relation of the Church with Non-Christian Religions, Nostra Aetate, in our time, in our age. It was promulgated in 1965, and the Church had never produced a document like this before. Uh, in fact, there wasn't really even a, a body they could identify, and so they entrusted it to the Council on uh, Christian Unity. The uh, monumental contribution of Nostra Aetate should be reflected on. There were two roles that I could reflect. One, you could say, is the via negativa, to, to erase from our theological understanding the historical blame that had been incorrectly attributed to the Jews down to our time, and then also to point to those things that we hold most in common. And so the Declaration states that Jews and Christians share a spiritual patrimony in Abraham and his descendants. God called Abraham to gather together scattered humanity, making him the father of a multitude of nations. And the people descended from him would be entrusted with the promises made to the, to the patriarchs. The church, as the document reads, cannot forget that she received the revelation of the Old Testament through the people with whom God, in his inexpressible mercy, concluded the ancient covenant. And so St. Paul says, theirs is the sonship, the glory and the covenants, the law and the worship and the promises. Theirs are the fathers, and from them is Christ, according to the flesh. And so since the great spiritual patrimony common to Christian and Jews is so great, this synod wants to foster and recommend that mutual understanding and respect, which is the fruit, first of all, of biblical and theological studies, as well as of fraternal dialogue. Now, the Declaration also reminded us, and this is perhaps a word to us uh, Christians and uh, Catholic Christians perhaps present here today, reminded us of the theological understanding, just to understand what Jesus did and what the cross meant, and that is that the church has always held and holds now that Christ underwent his passion and death freely because the sins of men, of humanity, and out of infinite love in order that all might reach salvation. And so the Apostle Paul says, he humbled himself being obedient, accepting even death, death on a cross. And so just for our believers out there, the other, you know, kind of more complete uh, understanding is that though there were human instruments at that time, our theological understanding is that this is something Christ freely embraced, that he accepted. And so the issue of blame in that sense becomes a point that is moot. Nonetheless, the legacy that was so well articulated is something that we have to acknowledge. So here's the money line. The church, mindful of the patrimony she shares with the Jews, and moved not by any political reasons, but by the gospel's spiritual love, decries hatred, persecutions, displays of anti-Semitism, directed against Jews at any time and by anyone. Once again, the church decries hatred, persecutions, displays of anti-Semitism directed against Jews at any time and by anyone. 
It's difficult to overstate the historical and theological import of this teaching, and it's more remarkable given the times as they were then. In the words of St. John Paul II, Nostra Aetate was an expression of faith and inspiration of the Holy Spirit as a word of divine wisdom. In the 50 years plus, the Catholic Church has repeatedly stood by the Jewish people in remembering the horror of the Shoah, which Benedict XVI denounced as a brutal extermination of Jews by a godless regime inspired by neo-pagan racist ideology. Now, the progress of theological dialogue that has been made since is no less impressive. Really, the deeper understanding at a theological level of our shared patrimony to realize the common roots that we have, to have a deeper appreciation for the covenant with the chosen peaceful, and to have a, a, a more complete opportunity to reflect on what we share. So to erase the canard, the, the via negativa, and then also to look to that which we share in common. Um, one of the items that wasn't uh, mentioned, but I, I'm here and I mean, I just, we're all trying to make this a priority. I had about three different events and I felt I, I needed to be here because I didn't want this horror to go unacknowledged and and to, to fail to stand in solidarity with my Jewish brothers and sisters. Um, I'm happy to give some more practical examples, but perhaps that can help us as we continue our reflection. Thank you for those beautiful remarks and the reminder of the need for all of us to stand in solidarity on important issues like this. Um, Professor Weiss, I, I will come to you in just a moment with a specific question, but I've had about six or seven questions come in that have a similar theme that I think is worth opening up to the entire panel. And uh, that is a question that a number of students are asking about how do we debate about issues like Israel or its policies or the need for a ceasefire? How do we engage in respectful or even vigorous discussion about this? And what's the difference between that and anti-Semitism? Where do we draw the line? How has our State Department drawn the line? So, uh, Ken, I know that you have written about this, but uh, other panelists should feel free to jump in on this important question as well. Sure. I'll... Um maybe start it going. I'll say that those of us who are fighting anti-Semitism have often found definitions to be more central to what we do than when we're dealing with various other groups. And I think that that derives in part from a long evolution of anti-Semitism over time. Um, we heard from Jeff about uh, certain uh, ancient doctrines like supersessionism that would put, I think, um, some forms of anti-Semitism uh, well within uh, the jurisdiction of a religious liberty institute, that is to say, uh, longstanding uh, religious uh, animosities. Uh, we heard from Ruth about uh, Villa Mar and the uh, League of Anti-Semites, which essentially built on uh, pseudoscientific racial notions, giving a new racial uh, aspect to uh, anti-Semitism. Uh, we also heard from her about the notion of the little Satan and the big Satan, right? A sort of a political response, which I think has... Um, antecedents going uh, way back in time. Uh, but this had to do with, uh, in part, with uh, Israel as the collective Jew, uh, as the repository of all of the negative attitudes that people have often had towards Jews. So with a mutating, evolving form of bias, it's sometimes difficult to figure out uh, what is anti-Semitic and what is not, which has led to definitions. And uh, while there are different definitions for different purposes when it comes to practical uh, purposes, there's one definition that's been adopted by over 40 countries around the world, and that's been used over the last four presidential administrations, certainly in foreign policy, of the United States and to some extent domestic policy. It's also been embraced by more than half of our states to some extent. And that's the so-called, if I say IRA, uh, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance Working Definition of Anti-Semitism, which in a nutshell says that with respect to contemporary issues, not all criticism of Israel is anti-Semitic, but some is. Um, and then give some examples, which during the Obama administration, Secretary Clinton, I think, helpfully uh, grouped under three categories based on Refusenik Natan Sharansky, so-called 3Ds, saying that if 
uh, Israel is demonized, not just criticized, but demonized, treated as having a sort of uh, otherworldly, sinister attribute in the same way that this had been attributed to the Jewish people historically. If double standards are used, not just criticism of Israel similar to other states, but a completely different set of uh, standards, if um, there are efforts to delegitimize uh, the Jewish state, again, not just criticize it, but question whether the Jewish state has even any legitimacy in the same way this has been done to the Jewish people over time. Context matters. There may be reasons why these things are done, but generally speaking, this can be a guide to determining when something might be anti-Semitic and not something else. So I would say that is the one definition that has a fairly significant degree of international uh, acceptance, especially at the governmental level. And I think uh, when we were talking about this earlier, you said that the way that Secretary Clinton and others would employ this is that if one of those three Ds is present, so a demonization, a delegitimization, or a double standard, there's a presumptive anti-Semitism context could rebut that, or it's sort of a red flag if those sorts of techniques are being employed. Is that right? Yeah, there are words like taking into consideration the uh, overall circumstances, which I put a kind of floridly gloss on to use the term presumption that's not in the definition itself, but I believe that it's an appropriate way of reading it. And the thing about legal presumptions is that they can be overcome depending on the circumstances. That is to say, if there are double standards used against Israel, that's a reason to ask some questions. Um, why is that? Is there a legitimate non-discriminatory reason for that? Uh, I once had a, a rabbi who uh, argued that we should use more stringent principles and standards in, in assessing Israel than any other country. The fact that he's a rabbi doesn't mean that he's not an anti-Semite, but he, he's not. He isn't. He's actually a Zionist. And the reason he wanted different standards for Israel is that he believes that we all should use more stringent standards for ourselves and our communities than we apply to others. So that's an example of he used double standards, but there's a legitimate non-discriminatory reason for it. So that's what I would mean by a presumption. Anything, any other panelists wants to add to that question before I ask a different question? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, a little impatient. I uh, appreciate all the work that's done into this. It's not my language, not my approach. Um, what I would say is, where's the map? Uh, and that's why I started with that. Why the bicyclists? The basic question is, why are you talking about Israel? Where did that come from? And what I would say is that I don't think that if you want a real discussion of Israel in any connection whatsoever nowadays, given the uh, ferocity uh, and, as I say, the lopsidedness of the war against it, um, here's what I would say. Where is the map? Every classroom that discusses this Every person who is going to discuss it should have a map in his pocket of the entire Middle East. That's all that's needed. Give me a map of the entire Middle East, and I want to know where's Waldo. In other words, can you even find this country on the map? What are you talking about? Why? Because you think you cannot affect the behavior of those other countries? You think the only country that you can pressure is Israel, therefore that's where you should keep pressuring? What makes you think that? Our subject has to be the reality of the entire Middle East, the entire Muslim world. That's the world of Islam. Now, they don't want Islamophobia. But how could, what, what's the connection between Islamophobia and these actions of Hamas? That's the subject. The subject is the war against Israel. And I think that if you put the map up there and you have that map in front of you all the time and you have this discussion within the context of that map, like Egypt, Syria, Iran, I mean, Iraq, uh, what is happening now with the war in Yemen, what is happening in Sudan where there's still slavery, what is happening in Saudi Arabia, which tries so much now to modernize itself and the, is it going to be able to succeed? Do you see what I mean? I mean, there is a world out there, a real, real, real world out there. And that's our obligation. 
And where the Jews fit into this, I, if I were, if this were an all-Jewish audience, I would be saying, as I say to <laughs> the great problem with the Jews is solipsism. Solipsism, as you know, right, is the idea that you are the only reality in the world. And because Jews are so self-accountable, which is a wonderful quality, they love to talk about themselves. And as Ken said, I want to be better. We have to be so much better than anyone else. And we have to do this, and we have to do this. And we, well, I would say, I don't want to talk about how great we are or how bad we are or how indifferent we are or something. It's a wonderful subject and we love to get into it. But if you're really serious about the world, it's time to move the topic and to make sure that we talk about the reality of actually billions of people. Do you know that there are only about 14 million Jews in the world or maybe 15 million? What is that? compared to the reality of out there. So you see, that's where I think the crux of the problem lies, even before you get into all these definitions. Maybe I'll just add a quick response as well, which is to say that, you know, I welcome those discussions and would encourage students who want to learn more to actually learn more about the situation in the Middle East in order to discuss it. Where I think the problem comes in is when people project all of the problems that the rest of the world is facing onto Israel and try to understand their own domestic problems or problems from other parts of the world and graft that onto Israel. And they do that because of the historic importance of Israel in the Western tradition and in, uh, and in the American mindset. But you know, look at a, to call Israel an apartheid state is taking a specific problem, a legal system that was in place in South Africa and trying to understand a different country through that lens. It doesn't work. Israel has its own problems and its own abuses of human rights and inequities, but it's not apartheid. Apartheid is something else that happened in South Africa. Um, same thing with settler colonialism. Settler colonialism refers to a particular type of colonialism that took place in the New World. It doesn't apply to a place like Israel, where there are where you know Jews have as equal claim to indigeneity as Palestinians, um, as do many other groups that have passed through. I mean, this story of you know history is a story of human movement. So to take these issues that explain one part of the world and ignorantly try to apply it to another part of the world, I think that's where um, that's where we get problems. They just become empty slogans um, without any knowledge behind them. But I'd encourage people to study it and debate it once you understand the situation, once you know the history, once you know the politics, then you can debate it. But not just take your own conceptions of your own country or other countries that you know something about and grafting it and projecting it onto Israel. Uh, another question that I want to pose both to uh, Professor Weiss in particular uh, and Professor Badlinger is how has Holocaust education helped, uh, if at all, when it comes to anti-Semitism, potentially in the United States, or what is the relationship between those two issues? Uh, it's, it's a very, very difficult subject. Um, um, I would um, confess to you that uh, within my own community, mine is not a popular uh, approach. I have never favored Holocaust education as such. And uh, while I very much appreciate the role of the Holocaust Museum as a research institution, because I think that there was so much lying and so much attempt to hide things that keeping the record straight and having, as, as Jeffrey would say, really, the historical reality confirmed is really the greatest function that it plays, and it's a very, very important function. But it makes me um, very sad um, to see what Holocaust education was assumed to do. It was never my assumption. Somehow the idea was, and I think it may be theological, rather than political. They wanted a theological idea that in a sense, if Jesus died for our sins, maybe the Holocaust is that writ large. Maybe somehow that's going to be a redemptive thing to show people this killing and this murder. Maybe this is going to be kind of a redemption of the world. It's never the way I saw it. I saw it as a copycat possibility. What the Holocaust shows is the triumph of anti-Semitism and the failure of Jewish political strategy. That's what it shows to me. 
And at the center of the Holocaust Museum, there are certain exhibits which are missing because they wanted to theologize it rather than make, for example, it was the Mufti of Jerusalem who went to Germany during the war and he plotted with Hitler, urging Hitler to kill every last Jewish child to make his work easier. So that nexus between uh, fascism and what the Muslim Brotherhood still tries to do today, that's forged right there, but you'll never see it in a Holocaust museum. Why? That's the political reality. So that's one thing. And then let me just say that the Holocaust Museum points the finger itself, as it should, of course, because it's constructed. It's Nazism is bad, and Nazism is anti-Semitism, Nazism is evil, and so on. Well, okay, no getting away from that. But in 1939, there was a pact, you know, between the two uh, totalitarian regimes, communism and fascism. And that's what launched the Second World War. And in its own way, internationalism is just as anti-Semitic in its own way, because if you see internationalist organizations have no use for the Jews who to them represent the most reactionary thing of all. The Jews are both a religion and a nationality combined both things which are against modern secular internationalist thought. So you see from a communist perspective, and that goes over to a socialist perspective, the Jews are also anathema, or not the Jews so much. Socialist Jews are okay if they're willing to be socialist, but if they are, if they want Israel to be a Jewish state, define itself in any way that it wants to, that is really to them also the epitome of evil. So you see what I mean about Holocaust education in a way has simplified things. It has simplified things. And uh, while uh, obviously one wants the history known, one wants it confirmed, one wants all those things done, I think that America would have been better served if it had been told the history of the Jewish people in the 1940s. How about this? This is a people that between 1940 and 1945 was all of its European base was eliminated. One third of the Jewish people eliminated in five years under humiliating circumstances. And within that same decade, this people recovers its national sovereignty after 2000 years. Now, God, that is a story to rival even America, which I think America has the greatest foundation story ever. And I, I can't tell you how much I love the history of this country, but how about that for a miracle, right? But that is not what it tells. It tells only the first part. Sorry. Bishop McCurry, you wanted to jump in? Uh, certainly. Um, I actually hadn't heard the um, kind of potential redemption analog, certainly from a Christian perspective, uh, that needs to be refuted as, as an error if there were sentiments of that. Um, I think my own sense of remembering our stories um, has been pronounced over the years. Um, when I was named a bishop at the time, I was pastor of what is the National Shrine of the Little Flower Basilica in Royal Oak, Michigan. Now, those of you who have ears, you will know what that means, because that's the pulpit from which Father Coughlin preached what can only be described as anti-Semitic hate. And when I was appointed the pastor there, and I had through other experiences, you know, uh, had Jewish friends and so on, but I thought, I need to understand what I thought. <laughs> I need to understand the story of where I'm walking into from the perspective of my Jewish brothers and sisters. I need to be friends with a rabbi. You know, I, I need to have that so that I can come to understand that the church that I looked at as a beautiful edifice with 4,500 families and a preschool through high school, beautiful outreach to the poor, love and compassion, was a symbol of anything but that for people who 
came to encounter the legacy of Father Coughlin, who, for those of you who are not familiar, had the most popular radio show in the United States, uh, whose rhetoric increasingly got into uh, what can only be described as these, you know, I mean, he was trying to make a lot of distinctions, which are still here today. I mean, it was anti-Semitic, you know, good Jews, bad Jews, you know, uh, comparative suffering. What's happened to the Jews here is bad, but what's happening to Christians is worse. You know, all this kind of just... Uh, uh, really uh, problematic to say the least. And and so I knew that I was taking on that legacy and I just thought I, I need to hear the story and, and not necessarily perhaps the story of the, of the Shoah or the Holocaust directly, but it's helpful to understand and, and come to appreciate from another to build those relationships. And so, I mean, if I have a sign of hope and I, and I don't want to be kind of hokey in this, but really friendships matter huh. because I made it, I mean, what's sad is, is, is Rabbi Moskowitz, who describes anti-Semitism as the chronic disease of humanity, <laughs> the chronic disease of humanity. So it, it's not just about the last 50 years or the last 80 years or the last 100 years, but as the, the professor outlined, it's, it's a litany of history uh, that we have to deal with that didn't, didn't begin and didn't, didn't end at that time. But the, but the point is, making that friendship, I knew that there would be some flashpoint that would happen. I mean, there were times that people would paint swastikas on my church, and there were times that anti-Semitic activities occurred. And, and, and so when the Tree of Life synagogue hit, what mattered the most to him is that I called him that morning. And I said, I, I don't know if I can do anything, but I want to let you know um, I, I'm with you and I'm praying for you, and I can't imagine the unbearable pain you and your people are experiencing. And it was the friendship of, you know, when you're a cleric, you know, you talk about like, boy, wish you had more, more kids coming to the church or the synagogue, you know, we tried our summer camp program and it's not going as well as it used to, you know, you're, you're kind of doing the work of that role. You just share so much in common, you know, as, as brothers, but when the crisis moment hits, the relationship is there. So you, so you can reach out. And uh, he invited me to come to their Shabbat. And I, and I knew as I walked up and he said, well, will, will you, you know, will you, will you help us lead Psalm 23? And uh, when he introduced me and said, this is the pastor of the shrine, a little flower. I mean, the ripples in that room, like, huh? <laughs> I mean, I'm just, and, and not out of personal disrespect for me. I, I mean, but, you know, it was like, what, here, how? Um, how, how, what universe is this making sense? You know, Um but that solidarity in that moment uh, meant so much. And my understanding how he saw, not just like Christianity or Catholicism generally, but how he and how others literally saw um, the church that I was leading with a whole different history. And there was a way that the easiest thing for me to do to be very candid as pastor is to say, well, that was then, this is now. But I, but I, I don't have that option and I shouldn't be given that pass. Um, and so to me, and that's why I wanted to make sure when I was invited, if I could come here and I would, I even think they knew I was the pastor of shrine at the time I was invited. I said, like, I, I like, this is my obligation. I, I gotta come because I just know those moments of solidarity are important, but I think whether it's the, the specifics of the show up and how they're portrayed, I think it's very easy for those who have not experienced that to want to move beyond, there's like a natural tendency to say things are better and it's working out better. And uh, if, if I have a sign of hope to share, it's that relationships matter, getting to know from the other perspective matter, and then standing with each other in moments of solidarity matter. And uh, hearing and reminding ourselves of those histories uh, can serve a, a valuable tool so that those of us might otherwise have blind spots uh, have our eyes more widely opened. Wonderful, thank you. Just a few brief interventions from uh, Professor Bidlinger and Kent. Uh, yeah, so I'll be, I'll be very brief just to say, as somebody who is, you know, dedicates my life to Holocaust education, I um, might disagree with, uh, with Ruth's characterization of Holocaust education. I do think that uh, many years ago, there was an aspect of Holocaust education that focused on redemption. And there probably still is in some circles, but I don't think serious historians of the Holocaust at the university level certainly um, don't teach it that way. And instead, we teach about the dynamics of hatred and the and the mechanics of violence 
and how um, you know how rhetoric can be turned into violence and a whole bunch of other things that I don't have time to go into. Um, but I do think that Holocaust education is extremely valuable. Um, in the state of Michigan, we have a law that requires Holocaust education be implemented in K-12 schools. Um, I would like to see the way it's implemented reformed a little bit, um, but I do think that it's extremely, extremely valuable. And then also just on the Mufti of Jerusalem point, I mean, I think Hitler was perfectly capable of coming up with those ideas without the intervention of Mufti of Jerusalem. Um, so I think that bears worth saying. Um, uh, sure, I'm hum Never again. <laughs> so I'm humbled that uh, sitting next to a Holocaust education expert. A few years ago, I did some work on this issue with the Organizations for Security and Cooperation in Europe, OSCE and UNESCO and was uh, pleasantly surprised that both organizations agreed on this uh, uh, point, um, which is that Holocaust education is extremely valuable, um, not because it helps uh, eliminate anti-Semitism, but despite the fact that according to research, um, it doesn't necessarily do that at all. And in fact, one organization supported it largely as a means of advancing human rights education, the other as a means of um, advancing global citizenship education, both of them, broadly speaking, uh, arguing it should be used in order to advance understanding of what one might call democratic values. However, with the uh, awareness that Holocaust education has various potential limitations, um, it can um, make it more difficult and not easier for students to understand contemporary examples that are very different than Nazi Germany, make it easier to deny contemporary anti-Semitism when it's not um, uh, looking like, uh, uh, like Nazism and, and concentration camps, and because it can create a situation where if Jewish people appear in a curriculum at all, it's either as biblical figures or as uh, Holocaust victims. And for that reason, to address anti-Semitism as opposed to the other democratic values, recommended some combination of anti-Semitism education that would include contemporary issues and what you might call ethnic study of the Jewish people so, so that there's a fuller understanding of what it has meant to be Jewish in this world. We're starting to get close on time, so I'm going to end by combining two questions, one of which is, there's been a series of questions that have come in from students, uh, actually both of these questions, so I'll, I'll try and synthesize them. But one refers to uh, some of the issues that we have seen recently on campuses where there have been uh, issues uh, and attacks on Muslim students as well. And the question is, how do we get better in our country? of living alongside each other with difference, the types of things Bishop Glory was talking about, standing up for each other um, and having shows of solidarity. But also, as Mark has pointed out, recognizing that every time we focus unique attention, uh, or even just having this discussion now about anti-Semitism, uh, is it meant to undermine any of those broader pluralism values? Um, how do we also recognize, at least what has been in my lifetime, unprecedented challenges that our Jewish brothers and sisters, as Bishop McClory said, are facing and show solidarity in those sorts of issues? Um, and then I guess the second related point is that one, one student put it really nicely. What is the solution and how do we, how do, where do we go from here as a country? How do we combat this issue on campus? How do we have a stronger pluralism in our country? So there's a lot there, but I want to, open that up broadly so that in your concluding remarks, panelists, you can take any of those uh, those pieces that you'd like. Why don't we start with Bishop McClure and then we'll come down the... Come down the uh, certainly. I mean, the, the topic here uh, today, obviously, is on the rise of anti-Semitism in colleges and beyond. Uh, I have a, a, a Jewish friend of mine uh, whose son is, you know, assessing right now what uh, graduate programs to go to, uh, in his field of expertise, uh, a program in Italy or the Netherlands might be the best, but he's going to get his master's in Israel because Europe doesn't feel like a safe place right now uh, for him. And uh, so he's making real world decisions on his future based on the fact that he knows there are places where he would be unwelcome. I think, you know, it, it, the word solidarity really matters. Um, solidarity may not bring with it solutions, uh, but solidarity is built on mutual understanding and respect. And in the example that I gave previously, I think we do that 
not just in moments of crisis where it's important, but you you invest in those relationships ahead of time so that you can come to understand. Uh, even October 6th, things were very bad, as we heard, uh, but you do it hopefully just as a sustained commitment to know each other so then one doesn't feel uh, isolated. Solidarity means that we stand together. It doesn't mean you agree on everything. I mean, obviously, there are different theological perspectives and so on, and we, we acknowledge all that, but I think... Uh, to stand in solidarity it means to call evil evil when we see it. It means to bring comfort and compassion to those as they are suffering. Uh, and so it means to, by word and deed, uh, support those uh, when those times come. But it's it's best when you just build that at a very human label uh, level before those relationships come. I mean, as a bishop, you know, I mean, I could I could spend more time on the theological side of things. I think there's just great fruitfulness there. I think our understanding and our deeper appreciation for some of the reasons that I mentioned earlier, that's kind of work we have to do in, uh, as Catholics and in interreligious dialogues. But uh, it, I think it is as simple as getting to know each other better so that we can be with each other when the moments of crisis come uh, day in and day out. Thank you. Well, I would say that this in itself has made me feel a little bit more hopeful on every ground. But as you take the theological approach, let me just press home the uh, uh, the political one a little bit. Um, this may come from left field, as it were, but I asked myself what I would do at the universities uh, in answer to this question. And I'll tell you on the basis of Harvard, where I taught for 21 years, if you, I wanted to correct this question, you know where I would begin? With ROTC. <clears throat> if you take evil seriously, and you are a country, you had better educate the best and the brightest. In the very years that they would join the military, you had better make them aware of the fact that a democracy that does not defend itself and know how to defend itself at the highest level is not going to survive. The Jewish people learned this at such cost that here's a people that never fought, never had an army for 2,000 years that learned that the only thing that has made them viable is the performance of their military. And I think Americans think that they can do without somehow. And uh, I, I don't have to say this here because I know your record is very different from Harvard's, but Harvard did not allow ROTC on campus for 40 years. The faculty did that. They didn't allow it on campus. Now, when you're talking about the rise of all these negative ideologies that come and they say, America's lousy, America's terrible, Israel is like America, Israel is the embodiment of all that's bad in America, part of that if they were members of, you know, training for the military and being trained historically in what makes this country remarkable as part of that, it would never happen. I, I would I would bet on it that this is not very powerful. Uh, these this anti-Semitism that we're encountering on campus, I'll bet it's not very powerful in the people who are serving in the military. Um, I too agree um, in education as the as at least one of the solutions. I think we need to listen to each other a little bit more. I think we need to learn from each other a little bit more. Um, I don't think slogans help, carrying banners help. You actually have to do the deep reading and understand somebody else's situation. Um, we need to understand why each other are in pain. And there's a lot of pain going on right now on all sides. And I think we need to talk to each other and learn about each other's histories and learn about each other's perspectives. Um, when I have these uh, rallies taking place, uh, you know, my window overlooks our campus diag, we call it, and that's where the rallies take place. And I hear them outside my office all the time. And I think if only I could get those students in the classroom and have them talk to each other in a respectable environment that we can create in a university classroom, it's a lot easier to control and to have discussions based on sources, based on evidence, instead of yelling at each other in the diag or on the quad. Um, I think we could make a lot of progress. It's not going to solve all the problems. We're still going to have very deep disagreements, but at least we can learn to listen to each other a little bit better uh, than we're doing right now. Well, I thank you for giving me the last word because I'd like to say a word about law, which I think doesn't necessarily deserve the first word in the conversation, but probably the last. 
Um, may I guess that we have some law students in the in the room? <laughs> but, uh, okay, uh, I think a lot of law students. That's great. So let's say, however else we address this problem, we should do it as lawyers. Um, and I'll say a word about that. Within the last month, we at the Louis D. Brandeis Center have brought legal actions against Wellesley College, against the University of Pennsylvania, against uh, the University of California at, at Berkeley. Now, when we approach a problem as lawyers, it isn't just about bringing lawsuits and administrative claims. Oftentimes, it's about working with uh, clients uh, so that they can uh, speak for themselves in a way that will be heard because they can frame their concerns in ways that will resonate with administrators because they're based on law, legal responsibilities, legal obligations. Sometimes it's a matter of working with administrators to achieve voluntary compliance because there may be well-meaning administrators who are not in compliance because they simply don't have either all of the facts or all of the law. There are lots of things that lawyers can do short of litigation, but litigation is often what matters. In the United States, it is often law that drives social change, law that requires accountability, law that gets us to justice. So whatever else we do, and there are lots of other things that we do, and I do not want to give short shrift to any of them. For those of you who might be studying the law, I would say that you will have as lawyers uh, the capability to do this. And I would say resist a temptation to separate uh, values from uh, your opportunities uh, going forward. Even in law school, if people are interested, I'll just make a plug. The Louis D. Brandeis Center has uh, clerkships for law students who are interested in doing work uh, in this area. We have chapters at many uh, law schools, not, not yet at this one, but we do have chapters and, and bring in uh, education on this uh, topic. And we do have jobs for uh, attorneys who are interested in fighting anti-Semitism. Anti so whatever else we do, those of us who have an interest in the law, we can make a change through public policy. We can make a change by using legal tools to achieve voluntary compliance. And when necessary, we can make a change through active legal advocacy. One thing I'll just say in closing, um, first of all, thank you all for joining us in this conversation. I think conversations like this are precisely part of the answer, part of the way forward to have more discussions, to learn from each other, to learn about different perspectives. Um, and I'm grateful to Marcus again for making it possible for us to have this platform. And part of the work that we do with our Religious Liberty Initiative in general, uh, obviously including and not just uh, limited to anti-Semitism issues, but trying to increase a world where we do have the type of solidarity that Bishop McClury spoke about and the people who are willing to stand up for others, even beliefs not their own in times of need. One of the briefs that Marcus likes to talk about a lot that our Religious Liberty Clinic filed early on was a brief representing um, multiple Muslim organizations and scholars who were speaking out in defense of the Orthodox Jewish community in New York when that community was being targeted during COVID. And as Rick likes to say, uh, the Muslim uh, plaintiffs are standing up for Jewish uh, congregations in New York, but in a Catholic university with a Mormon director. God bless America. <laughs> and uh, I'm grateful, grateful for you all being here to participate in precisely conversations that we hope lead to a brighter future where there's more of that. So thank you all for your courage and your remarks. <laughs> For your words and for this. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for your words. Yeah. <laughs>